Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. It's been a while since I've put a video up because of life stuff, but today I thought I'd focus on animal physiology because it's really, really interesting. And what we're going to do is focus on speed, both maximal speed and sustained speed, and endurance and look at some of the animals that excel in these two areas. August Kroll, back in 1929, said something that's often been repeated, and that is that for a large number of problems there will be some animal of choice, or a few such animals, on which it can be most conveniently studied. And this was obviously in the context of anatomy and physiology. And that remains true to this day. Of course, the animal of choice for most physiology studies is the human. And when we talk about human exercise physiology, of course, we're looking at things like the uh, maximal sprinting speed, sustained speed, etc. And we can glean this from the world record performances of human beings. And a couple of interesting things jump out at me with this particular figure. Uh, the first is obviously the, the maximum speed, uh, which is an average speed, not a peak speed, of course. Um, that humans can achieve is about 37 kilometers per hour. And that then drops away very rapidly, but then stops dropping away quite so rapidly as you then start to use aerobic metabolism. You see that very, very long tail. This is the classic hyperbolic function of the speed or power duration relationship I've mentioned in previous uh, presentations. And this of course goes on for very much longer than that in terms of marathon, ultra-marathon performance, etc. But then we also have the curve for females. And there's a couple of things to note. First, the curve is exactly the same shape because it's determined by the same physiology. But there's also a consistent difference between males and females. So even within the same species of animal, you may find differences in performance, which you could also attribute to physiological factors in the case of uh, females having uh, secondary sex characteristics, lower muscle mass, lower heart mass, lower hemoglobin mass, etc. And that plays out for a consistent 10 to 12 percent difference in male and female athletic performance. What about animals? Well, in 2004, David Paul put this particular figure together showing the maximum speeds of a number of different animals. Now, obviously, the horse in this case has a rider on its back, but this is a horse's maximal sprinting speed, 65 kilometers per hour. Uh, a bear, 55 kilometers per hour. Uh, the deer, 70, and so on and so on. Notice that humans would not even appear on this figure, being down at 37 kilometers per hour. Peak speed in humans might touch 40 kilometers per hour, um, but only fleeting. And of course, the world champion, if you want to call it that, is, is well known to be the cheetah, the fastest animal on earth, followed up by the pronghorn antelope, the ostrich. There are a few others that aren't on this particular slide, but 120 kilometers per hour is the fastest terrestrial locomotion we have ever seen. And I'm not going to include fish and birds in this particular part of the presentation because we're simply talking about how much, how fast you can locomote uh, along the ground. Obviously this is one of David Paul's pieces of work so I'm not suggesting that David Paul can exercise at 52 kilometers per hour that's just because his name was at the top of the paper so no confusion there hopefully. So those are some of the athletic species and that's of course for maximal sprinting speed. And the thing about maximal sprinting speed is it's a little bit weird if you do it in kilometers per hour because then larger animals tend to be advantaged by that and smaller rodents, for example, they're going to be very, very rapid, um, don't get a look in. So the horse, for example, although it can gallop at up to 65 kilometers per hour, in terms of scaling that to the size of the animal, that works out to about 10 body lengths per second. Now the cheetah is undeniably faster than that and the cheetah can locomote at about 32 body lengths per second. But in terms of the absolute world champion in terms of mammalian terrestrial performance, that probably goes to Merrim's kangaroo rat. The kangaroo rat uh, has its own particular runs that it runs down, it runs extremely quickly 
uh, and it can achieve 110 body lengths per second. So that's probably, although you won't hear much about it, that's probably the sprint champion, at least among mammals. But sprinting comes at a bit of a cost. And so reaching very extreme speeds, of course, requires very rapid energy transfer and very powerful muscles, fast twitch muscles. And the cheetah has that in abundance. Now, once you've got up to those speeds and you generate that kind of metabolic heat, you can do one or two things with it. You can either store it or you can try and dissipate it. Unfortunately for the cheetah, it runs so fast and most of its machinery is dedicated to galloping that fast that it stores most of the heat that it generates in a sprint. And that allows only a few predatory sprints in a day it spends the rest of its time trying to cool down or to keep cool. And experimentally, if you put a cheetah on a treadmill, as Taylor and Roundtree found out, cheetahs will refuse to run if their core temperature gets too high. So they'll literally just fall off the back of the treadmill if they're running along it. And so that's where it becomes a limiting factor. So the cheetah is extremely rapid, but it also overheats extremely quickly. If you compare that for example, to the African hunting dog, which of course occurs in the same savanna uh, habitat, you can see that it stores very little of its heat. This is a percentage of e uh, metabolic energy that is stored in the body during uh, running at different velocities. And this was what uh, Taylor and Roundtree measured. And you can see the African hunting dog stores less than 20% of the heat that it generates, whereas the cheetah at similar speeds is storing more than 70%. And of course, the African hunting dog is able to pant whilst it's exercising. So it loses a lot of heat from its respiratory tract. So that's sprinting. Um, and when we go a little bit slower, of course, you then need to rely on uh, oxidative phosphorylation, aerobic energy transfer to power the uh, effort. And that's where maximal oxygen uptake comes into its own. So here we have the predicted VO2 max. So this is the uh, VO2 max you would expect from a normal uh, scaled, um, how, how could I put this? So if you were uh, untrained or you're just looking at a normal animal, an unathletic animal, uh, for body size, this is the VO2 max that you would expect. You can see an elite human sits above that line uh, this is Linstead's work in 1991 uh, in Nature when they actually looked at the pronghorn antelope. But you can see a number of very athletic species. So this says wood house, that should be wood mouse. The flying fox, so it's a, a very large form of bat. Not a fox that's got its pilot license, but the fox itself is also no slouch in terms of aerobic performance. The dog also sits above the line. The horse, for its size, sits significantly above the line as does an elite human athlete. And then we have the bat. Bats have an extremely high metabolic rate, and that's one of the reasons why we think um, they are able to carry around and deal with things like coronavirus, because they have a very high metabolic rate, and they're therefore able to mount very, very strong immune defences. And then we have the pronghorn. The pronghorn antelope is the fastest animal in North America. And what's special about the pronghorn is not only is it extremely fast, as you saw on that previous slide, it can sustain that speed by virtue of having a very high VO2 max. Now, these VO2 max values are in milliliters per kilogram per second, and that's not that easy uh, to get your head around. So we'll put that in normal terms in a moment. But the pronghorn antelope, or uh, Antilocapra americana, um, it can gallop at up to 95 kilometers per hour. But it can also sustain speeds of 65 to 70 kilometers per hour. In other words, it can sustain a speed that a horse can reach in a maximal sprint. And it does that by having a very large maximal oxygen uptake of about 300 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Compare that to a normal human of 35 to 45 milliliters per kilogram per minute or an athletic species such as the horse of between 100 and 150 millilitres per kilogram per minute. This is an enormous VO2 max for an animal of its size. It's also worth pointing out that in terms of maximal sprinting speed, 
The fastest animals on Earth are typically in the order of 40 to 50 kilograms in body mass. And that's because of the trade-off between limb size and body weight is pretty much optimised for speed uh, in that particular range, for a galloping animal at least. And if you look at the pronghorn, you can see that anatomically it's got a very robust uh, thorax and uh, chest and neck. You can also see its nostrils as well. But you can see how thin the legs are. So all of the muscle mass is in that uh, in the, the trunk area, and then most of the rest is uh, bones and tendon. And that helps it gallop extremely quickly. And it's the fastest land animal in North America because of the extinction of its predator species, particularly the American cheetah. Yes, there was such a thing, and it was as fast as the African one, um, and as a result, the pronghorn is, if you like, overdeveloped in terms of speed. Just to give you some impression of what this means, to sustain a speed of 70 kilometers per hour means that a pronghorn antelope can gallop uh, 11 kilometers in 10 minutes. So it's an extremely fast animal. How does it do that? Um, well, what Lindstedt and colleagues did was compare the pronghorns that they were measuring to a domestic goat. And so on the extreme left, we have VO2 max, so that's for the goats in the, the dappled, and the dash line is the pronghorn. You can see it's got a VO2 max that's five times higher than a similar sized goat. It has a much higher lung volume, uh, much greater diffusing capacity, much greater cardiac output, higher hemoglobin concentration, not dissimilar muscle mass, so certainly the, the amount of muscle that the pronghorn has is not that dissimilar to a goat, but it also has a much higher mitochondrial density and mitochondrial volume. So every step in the O2 conductance pathway appears to be significantly higher in the pronghorn antelope. So every step is exceptional. There's not one thing the pronghorn's good at in terms of aerobic performance. It's really, really good at absolutely everything. So that's the pronghorn. How about endurance? And I'm going to argue uh, that, um, as Jones did in uh, 2016, that the bar-tail godwit is nature's greatest endurance athlete. Now, I did mention that I was talking about terrestrial runners. In this case, we're now looking at a bird. And so, apart from obviously the ability to fly, one of the major differences in uh, the avian physiology related to exercise is its lung function. So in the bird, unlike the human and other mammals, the bird has separated breathing from um, the process of respiration, in other words, getting uh, oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide out of the blood. So we have these uh, air sacs within the bird, and then we have the lung itself, which is based on counter-current exchange. So the lung capillaries and the, the uh, blood in those capillaries transits in the opposite direction to the flow of air in the lung. And that is a very efficient way of exchanging gases. Now, why humans and other mammals didn't evolve this system is anybody's guess. It is a far better system for gas exchange. But you can also see from this, uh, this is from Knute Smith Nielsen, you can see that a bird is essentially... Um, a pair of lungs with some wings, primarily, um, and so much of its uh, internal structure is dedicated to airflow and gas exchange. But the bar-tailed godwit is a particularly special animal. And it's particularly special because every year it migrates from Alaska to New Zealand, and of course it reverses the process as well. And so here we have the southbound flight path of the bar-tailed godwit. These distances are up to 12,000 kilometres. And what's special about this is you can see the track of some of these. These have obviously been, these birds have been tagged and tracked. You can see that they're being picked up flying over uh, the Hawaiian Islands. They don't stop there though. These birds travel non-stop from Alaska to New Zealand. This journey takes them about nine days and they do it 
in one hit. So what does that really take? Um, well, it's been studied, in fact, and the bartel godwitz migration is quite phenomenal. So it's extreme in duration. It takes between 9 and 11 days, and these birds do it non-stop. The flight itself, as any flight is, is energetically expensive, so they're exercising at 8 to 10 times their met resting metabolic rate. It's fueled by fat, and feeding probably isn't an option for these birds anyway, because it's been shown that, and uh, the way they show this is quite macabre actually, what happened in Alaska was a flight of godwits accidentally flew into a radar dome and many of them were killed. And that allowed um, the scientists to dissect these birds and figure out what they were actually composed of. And like many migrating birds, what appears to happen is before migration, the birds more or less consume their guts and convert them to fat. And so when they take off, these birds are about 55% fat by body mass. And that's what fuels the exercise. In other words, they spend no time whatsoever eating as they're uh, migrating because they can't. They have to rebuild their digestive tract when they land at the other side, so when they land in New Zealand. The effort itself is equivalent to a human running at ultra marathon speeds non stop for more than a month. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention for a month at altitude because their cruising altitude is between two and 5,000 metres. In other words, the bar-tailed godwit is an absolutely phenomenal athlete, and I can't put it any more fairly than that. What does this look like for humans? Well, if you think about the bar-tailed godwit and its use of body fat, we could liken it to extreme efforts like the Antarctic expeditions of the early 1900s, and Hassley and Stroud, Mike Stroud, who was involved with Ranulph Fiennes in uh, their own uh, polar exploration. This is a plot of what the Scots of the Antarctic uh, expedition might have looked like. So this is estimated energy expenditure and estimated energy intake. And you can see that when they uh, killed the ponies before going on to the uh, Antarctic plateau, and then they reached the South Pole by the 17th of January, you can see their energy expenditure rose dramatically, and that's because they were having to carry now all of their food. And of course, then they lost uh, Evans uh, after just, about, just before 15 weeks, uh, then Captain Oates died, and then the others perished, died of starvation, and they were only 11 miles from safety at this point but they had expended so much energy that they did not have enough energy to continue the task. And you can see there is a little bit of a hook here. That's where they'd actually stopped moving entirely. Um, and then, of course, their energy expenditure, they'd run out of food at this point, and they unfortunately uh, succumbed to starvation. That's why you see that drop-off, late drop-off in body mass. More modern expeditions, this is Mike Stroud and Ranulph Fiennes, their uh, solo expedition of Antarctica. And what you see here is their body weight, their energy intake and their protein intake. Just look at the body weight of Mike Stroud and Ranulph Fiennes. So start off at 70 and 90 kilograms. Um, by the end, uh, Mike Stroud has lost, and both of them have lost, about 20 kilograms of body mass. And you can see the... Uh, the track and the way in which they went through this and you can see uh, by the end there's episodic hypoglycemia, marked muscle pains, Mike Stroud frostbitten. Temperatures here you can see minus 15 which is quite balmy compared to what they suffered from at the end so it gets down as low as minus, point, minus 48. So constantly cold and hungry etc. And then they recover and you can see that the recovery um, even after just a few days they're putting on significant amounts of uh, body mass and that's because of uh, the uh, extreme energy intake both just before and just after uh, their uh, just before leaving and just after arriving back in the UK. So if you think about the bar-tailed godwit it carries its own food in the form of body fat 
when you're a polar explorer, you have to carry an awful lot of your food in a sled behind you. And therefore, the bar-tailed godwit is better than you. So that's a quick whistle-stop tour of extreme speed and endurance in animals. So what have we learned from that? Well, first of all, the same physiological things that makes humans fast and makes humans endure is taken to extremes in some animals. In the cheetah, there's an extreme ad adaptation in sprint mechanics and energy transfer, leading to very high sprinting speed. In the case of the pronghorn antelope, we have extreme adaptations to the O2 conductance pathway, and that produces extreme sustained speed. And in the bar-tailed godwit, we have extreme adaptations in energy management, and that leads to extreme endurance. And humans can adapt each of these systems themselves as well, but obviously to a far smaller extent. And therefore, um, we do have things we can do as humans to improve our sprint, sustained and endurance speeds, uh, but it's much more limited than our animal counterparts. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to this. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next time.